So, oops, that's Pascal's head. So I think I'm not Indiana Jones. I don't even <laughs> try to pretend, right? Yeah. Uh, maybe it's somewhere in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> and my favorite, favorite slide comes. So. <clears throat> Um, this talk and contents will be very different in flavor, um, so um, I will talk about the foundations of intelligence, um, the mathematical foundations, how that could be converted into algorithms, and um, I concentrate on general intelligence. So it's not something which you sort of which solves any real world problem in the next three or five years, but hopefully um, in 20, 30 years or so, um, this theory um, will sort of the form one of the foundations of um, the solution to the big AI problem, which some still dream about. Okay, so let me start here. Um, so what is the goal of AGI research? So the goal of AGI research, so there's a special G in there, which means general, is not to build special purpose AI systems which play chess or drive cars or recognize speech. We all have that now, but um, a system which is able to learn a variety of tasks, okay? Um, and on a human level, ideally, and then beyond. So actually I proposed two talks. One was more about the technological singularity. I will not much talk about that in this talk. So I mean, once we have human level AI, um, then they can sort of build more intelligent, more intelligent AI systems themselves. I mean, already now, computers support the development of the next generation computers, of new software, and so on, and that may lead to a technological singularity. And I have a slide on the end of that, but that's not the contents of this talk. <coughs> Okay, so um, what is intelligence or what is artificial intelligence? So who took already an AI class? Uh, maybe 30%, okay. Um, so the question is, is it to build systems, say, by trial and error, and you know, if they do something um, we think is smarter than previous systems, call it success, yeah? Or is it, mimicking biological systems. I mean, we have one example of a semi-intelligent system right here. Um, so um, there are various views on that. Um, but what we really need is theories which can guide us um, to search for new algorithms and find new algorithms, OK? Um, there are other ways, I have a slide on that, you know, just scan the human brain and, you know, simulate it and that's done. We have not understood anything. That's one approach, but I won't talk about this approach, okay? So, um, to uh, show you what I'm doing and what I'm not doing here, um, look at this diagram here. So, we think, first when we think about intelligence, we think about, okay, humans thinking, right? Okay, that is this box here, yeah? And that's what cognitive science is about. So how humans think, okay? We could also be interested in how humans behave and act. I mean, the thinking process um, leads to some actions, and that's, for instance, the field of behaviorism, um, and the Turing test is about it. So the Turing test um, is, I, I'm not going to explain that, um, tests just the behavior of a human compared to an AI system. It doesn't care about the internal working, okay? So on the other hand, we could be interested in rationality, and I mean, this is not really a sort of, I mean, humans are also partially rational, but not necessarily, and if we talk about um, rational thinking, um, that's the field of you know, laws of thought, which then led to logic, reasoning systems, and so on, okay? And well, then there's a corner left here um, to think about rational systems which act rationally or do the right thing. And most of AI is nowadays in this lower right corner because what we really care about is we want to build agents, robot, or whatever, which do something we care about and many problems are hard, so they need to be smart and so on. And I mean, maybe you want to build emotional robots, right? That also has some um, applications, but as Pascal nicely explained to us, there are many, many big problems out there, very difficult decisions to make, and making right decisions is more or less synonymous to rationality, okay? So, and I'm talking about this right lower corner, I'm about systems which act rationally, and at the first step, I don't care about the internal working of the system, right? You know, maybe it's just an optimization thing, maybe it's a reasoning thing or so, that comes second, okay? The goal is to build systems that act rationally, okay? And not only in for some particular problem, and Pascal has told us very nice applications, but in general, okay? So here's an informal working definition now of intelligence. So intelligence measures an agent's ability to perform well in a wide range of environments, 
Okay, so the performing well is the rational action part, and the general thing is in a wide range of environments. Okay, so this doesn't look very exciting or deep, but actually um, we have gone through 70 definitions of intelligence in the psychology literature, in the philosophy literature, in the AI literature, from individuals and from groups, and there's a wide diversity. <coughs> But um, you can distill that, I mean, some are sort of outliers, of course, and uh, not, not all fit here, yeah? but that is sort of the essence, maybe, okay? Um, the hard part is now to turn that into algorithms, right? So to formalize all these words here, and before we can come to algorithms, we first have to sort of formally define these concepts, okay? Which I'm going to do now. So this talk will be more technical, but hopefully not too technical, okay? Um, now, um, there's another slide, um, things I won't talk about. So there are two approaches, I mean, there are many approaches, but I mean, if you have this economy, so two approaches, the natural approach to AI and the artificial approach. So the natural approach would look at nature and try to copy things, okay? So what we could do is we could, you know, take the human brain, scan it on a sufficiently fine resolution, simulate it in a computer, and we have degraded intelligence, you know? You know, maybe it sounds very easy, we just need the computation power, but maybe that's actually the way um, which will first lead to success. Yeah? But then, okay, we have all the, you know, also scanned all the problematic aspects of the human brain, so, um, and there are already enough humans around, so uh, maybe that's not the most exciting one. And then we haven't understood much. But, um, so the European Union just, the beginning of this year, announced their biggest grant ever of one billion euro to um, build whole brain emulation system, okay, in the next 10 years, okay? And the Americans sort of couldn't accept that just outright, so Obama announced a three million project doing the same thing, okay? But he only found 100 million dollars so far, okay? Um, but they print the money, so I mean, they have no problems, right? It's, <laughs> it's, it's hard in the European Union to get the money. Okay, so, and there are other possibilities, of course, um, genetic enhancement, we could enhance us, right? And, or augment our brains, you know, rather than typing an iPhone like this or speaking to it, we just implant a chip and communicate directly. Um, and um, that is actually a quite interesting way because if you build these systems very separately, you know, maybe they take over and they don't like us, but if we slowly extend us and, you know, I don't do calculations by hand anymore, I use my calculator and then uh, lots of knowledge I don't need to store in my brain anymore, I, I, I use um, in the internet, and if you connect it nicely, and then you um, use more and more sort of your extended brain, and everybody's doing that, and you know, maybe that will be at some point a time where, oh, I haven't used my own brain for the last two years, right? Everything I have delegated, so maybe I can switch this little biological part off or so, yeah? That would be a more graceful, gradual transformation to um, a post-human society. Okay, but uh, that's not the topic of this talk. Okay. So uh, I could have talked about it, but the organizers wanted something more serious. Okay, so um, I will talk about the artificial approaches, and there are many. So if you look at the history of AI, you know, it started with logic, language-based, sort of expert systems, reasoning systems, proving, um, so theory proving algorithms, and so on. Um, then the economics inspired approaches um, based on utility maximization, game theory, and so on. Um, um, cybernetics is um, inspired by engineers where you have a system and a controller and you want to optimize something and if the system um, is sufficiently complex um, then uh, then it's like sort of an intelligent system although I mean usually they sort of consider linear systems and quadratic loss functions and then big ones then they go beyond which is a little bit far away from AI. Um, it's very hard to build an intelligent system from scratch, right? It's very hard to produce an intelligent adult. It's much easier to produce an intelligent baby. Oh, well, a baby is, is able to learn. So that is the machine learning approach where you build a system which learns everything by training it, okay? Um, we all know, I mean, what is an intelligent agent? Information gets in, information gets processed, information is output, so it's an information processing system. So information theory should be and is also very important. Yeah, and indeed, there's a close relation between actually data compression and intelligence. So I have a website and you can win up to 50,000 euro um, and I explain why data compression intelligence is you know, nearly the same thing, okay? Um, 
So, and well, we have all these approaches and well, separately, you get that far, but they are limited. Um, but if you put sufficiently many together, you can get much further, okay? So before um, starting with the background um, theories and ideas for a formal definition of intelligence, um, the next question is, I mean, can we actually develop a theory of intelligence? Yeah, maybe we could develop sort of an equation which is um, one billion pages long or something like that. I mean, but nobody can handle that. So the question is, can there be a simple theory of rational intelligence? And most people say, no, that can't be. I mean, I mean, look, we are very complex things, and you cannot compress intelligence to something you know, very simple. Yeah. Um, so that would be sounds not. Um, plausible. But now look at other fields. I mean, look at computing. I mean, if all our laptops and iPhones, they can do amazing things, but the Turing machine can do the same stuff, right? Okay? And the Turing machine is very simple. You can even, you know, take Game of Life. Who knows Conway's Game of Life, right? You know? This is Turing complete, yeah? So you can build a computer out of that. So you have these gliders, right? Regard them as electrons. Then you have glider cannons, which produces electrons, and then you can build spaceships sort of which absorb gliders and produce gliders. You can build not gates and end gates, right? And then you have circuits and then you can build a whole computer. So game of life is Turing complete. Yeah? So it's not only that you can use your computer to emulate game of life, you can also use game of life to emulate a computer. Okay? Which is very nice. Okay? And computers are very powerful. So we have a simple system, say a Turing machine um, or cellular automata which can do all of computing. Um, or, um, getting more to nature, um, look at all the cows and order phenomena here in nature. So you have a tree, and it's a beautiful tree, these complicated structures, but now there are simple mathematical theories which describe them, okay? And you've all seen um, Mandelbrot sets of fractals, right? And they are very simple mathematical equations. So the Mandelbrot set is just set equals set square plus C. That's it, right? In a small loop. So even shorter than you know, Pascal's program for solving Sudoku. Um, it's just a three-liner, and you get this beautiful landscape. So we have very simple theories, iterative maps we produce, trees, clouds, <coughs> turbulences, and so on. But even more express impressive, so look at chemistry. Uh, I mean, we have 100 different atoms, a million different molecules, and you can build all kinds of interesting stuff out of that. And all that, at least in principle, can be described by, not quad error demonstrandum, but by quantum electrodynamics, okay? So that's, um, well, the quantum theory which describes electromagnetics and that covers um, all processes except nuclear processes, essentially, and gravity, okay? Um, and, you know, possibly even superstring theory in physics, you know, that describes the whole universe. We don't know yet, right? It's very hard to compute anything. Okay, so given that we have, you know, a lot of examples, we have complex phenomena which can be described very, very, in very simple terms, um, it is not a priori implausible that not also intelligence could be described in very simple terms. And indeed, um, the IC model, which I want to show you um, now, um, is a theory of superintelligence. So that is the most intelligent agent possible in a certain sense. Okay? Um, so I will first go through the philosophical foundations, then the mathematical foundations, um, and then present the rational agent framework, and then some approximations and some really toy, especially compared to Pascal applications um, of this theory, okay? So first, um, we need Occam's razor. Um, who has not heard about Occam's razor? Okay, everybody, great. So when I was a student, I didn't hear about him, yeah, so that was, okay, not that, um, I don't know, maybe that was a bad university, and I wish I would have heard about him earlier. Actually, um, he died in my hometown, so in Munich, so he lived there for 13 years, um, and I still, and there's a street, uh, but I learned of him only when I was 30 or so. Yeah? So um, this is the most important principle of science. Not all agree, but most of them. Agree? So, um, and why is this principle important? I mean, probably heard, you've heard about Popper, you know, you should produce theories which can be falsified, but the point is, this is not enough. So here, let's look at these two hypotheses. Um, hypothesis one is all emeralds are green. Uh, so emeralds are these gemstones, you know, which indeed are green, so the girls 
know that, right? Okay. Um, um, so, and um, let's consider hypothesis two. All emeralds found till the year 2020 are green, and then thereafter they will be suddenly blue. Okay. So both hypotheses are consistent with all what we know, right? And both hypotheses are equally falsifiable, right? For both hypotheses, we have to wait till year 2021 and or 2020, and then take another sample. Okay. So what do we do? Well, we need another principle beyond falsifiability. Okay. And that is Occam's razor. And Occam's razor says um, you should take the simplest hypothesis, which is consistent with the data. And I will not go into all the philosophical you know, aspects. And um, this paradox goes much deeper um, than it looks. Um, hypothesis looks at least simpler. You know, if I count the number of letters or something like that, intuitively it is simpler. And that's the hypothesis we all take then also. Okay. And that's how science is done. And we don't use simple theories because they're simpler to deal with or whatever, simpler to compute or so. I mean, that is one aspect, but that's not, not the primary reason. We need the simpler theories because if we come up with obscure theories, they just don't work. Yeah? I mean, there's a deep philosophical problem here, but OK. So we need Occam's razor. That's the important point. OK, next. Um, okay, so there's one problem is, well, it talks about simpler theories and what is simple for one could be complex for another, so it's not so, I mean, it's not well defined what simplicity and complexity is. So the next thing, we have to well define formally what complexity and simplicity is, and since I'm dealing with general purpose AI systems, I need a very general definition, right? Not limited to some domain. Okay, and for this I need Turing machines, and you all know Turing machines, and interestingly, it's not the primary purpose is to compute something, but to specify this complexity, okay? Um, so um, I, I will skip that, you know, Turing machines are general computing device, and how can we use that now? So um, how could we specify the complexity of an object. So first, let's just you know scan this object, and it's a file, and you know the file is a bit string. So what could be the complexity of a bit string? Okay. So let's assume I have one million ones. Well, there's very little information content in that, right? If I have some, say, the digits of pi, well, it's more interesting, yeah? If I take a picture here of this room, it's maybe even more interesting, more complex, um, and so on. So an intuitive notion of complexity. Um, if you think about it, what we do is we describe our object right, or our bit string. And if the description is simpler, then we regard this object as simpler. So one million ones is a very short description, while if I take a picture here, that doesn't have a very short description. I, mean, I can compress it somehow. I mean, I have to compress that um, in a, in a loss-free way. It still gets somewhat smaller, but I cannot compress it down to sort of you know, 100 bits or so. Okay. And now we have to ask which language do you use. There are many languages out there, but there's a universal language that is based on universal Turing machine or a general purpose computer. So um, let's define the complexity of an object of binary string X as the length of the program which produces this string X. So a program is also, or um, a Turing machine provides a language, namely the language of programs, and if I run a program, it's sort of, you know, reconstructing the object from this description. A program is a description, okay? And um, this is a very powerful notion of um, complexity, and it's sort of universal because you have a universal language here. So whenever there is some effective structure in your data, in this way, you will extract it. Well, a downside is you can compute of complexity. You can show that it's like the halting problem and so on. But I will come to that in a second step. OK, um, next, what we need is if you build agents, agents will have, will not know everything about the world. So they must have beliefs about the world. And then they get new data, and they have to update their beliefs. And there's a very general way to do that. That is phase rule. So if you have a prior belief over some hypothesis H, and you get new data, and this is the probability, so the likelihood of your data, then you should update your beliefs in this form. So Bayes tells the agent how to update his beliefs. But Bayes does not tell you how, with which beliefs to start with. Okay, and that is a very difficult problem. If you have a simple scenario of two hypotheses and you don't know, you take a symmetry principle, 50-50 chance, and then you get the posterior and so on. Yeah? But if you have complex problems, so mathematically if the spaces are countable or non-compact or separable, um, you have a big problem in choosing this prior. 
But now we use um, Occam's razor and the quantification in terms of Kolmogorov complexity to specify this prior. And we say the a priori probability of an hypothesis is 2 to the power of minus its complexity. So we say a priori simple hypotheses are more plausible than complex hypotheses. Okay? So actually Occam's razor tells you to take the simplest hypothesis, but there's another principle, Epicurus principle, which tells you to keep all hypotheses, and they're sort of contradicting each other. And the compromise is, um, well, we keep all the hypotheses which are consistent. So even the idiotic one, you know, with the emeralds becoming blue, but um, we penalize them by having a smaller belief in them. Okay? So that's our a priori belief. And then with base rule, we get our posterior belief. And of course, if some data hardly roots, rules out some hypothesis, then the likelihood is zero, and then the posterior gets zero. So if you looked at in the posterior picture, um, what you do is um, the plausibility of a hypothesis is if it's still consistent with it, if it's inconsistent, it's zero, and if it's still consistent, um, it is two to the minus the complexity of the hypothesis then conditioned on the data you have seen. So you update your beliefs, okay? Um, and this was all done by Solonov already in the 60s, actually. So he put everything together, and you can represent it in many forms. And I represented it in a form which, um, where you don't see the connection to the previous slide, but I mean, this gives you a different picture. So Solomonov defined this distribution here, the M of X, and that is very interesting what you do here. You take a universal Turing machine with an input tape and an output tape. You put random noise on the input tape. This Turing machine, I mean, the, with some luck, you know, this input is, is some legal program, right? And the Turing machine does something and outputs something. The point is that it induces a probability distribution on the output tape, right? Okay. Um, which is very, very exotic. So you have uniform distribution on the input tape, and then you pipe it through a universal Turing machine, you get a distribution, and this distribution is M of X. And this distribution has very powerful properties. So what you can show is that if you use this distribution for predicting, whatever you want, say the weather tomorrow or the stock market or whatever you care about, um, this is in a sense the optimal way of making predictions if you don't know, have any extra prior knowledge about your problem. Okay? It doesn't mean if you use that you get rich on the stock market, but it means that if this fails, everyone, everything else will also fail, right? Or if some algorithm succeeds, this will also succeed. Again, a slight problem, this is incomputable, right? So um, we have to do something about it. Okay, next. So we're now at the prediction step. We can predict, but an agent is more. An agent also acts. Yeah? Agent has goals, usually. I mean, or you set the goal. The goal is to win chess or whatever, right? And um, so um, we need some loss function. I mean, you can talk about loss. It's a negative, or you talk about reward. It's a positive picture, but I mean, it's just a minus sign. So um, we again have the sequence here. Um, and then at time t, we make a decision. Then we say to take an umbrella. Then we observe that it's actually sunny. Um, and then we suffer a certain loss. Okay? And then we go to the next time step, t plus 1. And the goal is to minimize expected loss. Okay, you find it in many books, you know, minimize expected loss. That sounds easy, that sounds great, but expectation with respect to what probability distribution? Expectations, you know, means a probability distribution. So if you have a problem where we can perfectly specify the probability distribution, say you play Begemon and we know the dice um, and so on, so we can specify these probability distributions, everything is fine. But the real world is a very, very complicated place. I mean, I don't know the probability of the driver in front of me breaking and then the distance I should keep and so on. So we don't know this probability distribution. But it's like in the prediction case, right? So we don't know the distribution. But we could use Solomonov distribution for doing predictions, and you can show that it works very well. So we can also use the Solomonov distribution for making decisions. And what you can show is that first, asymptotically, this converges to the optimal decision um, if you would know the true distribution, right? And you can also show that the convergence rate is sort of as fast as possible and so on. So um, we take the expectation with respect to this universal distribution if you don't know the true distribution, which is in general the case. Okay, so far so good. Um, 
what I have not talked about here directly is, so if, you, if you're greedy and just greedily minimize the loss for the next time step, um, that is not good for many problems. I mean, you in chess greedily take the queen and um, then get checkmated, you know, it's not good, right? Yeah? So you need to plan ahead. And so what you have to do is, um, you have to do to, to minimize the long-term loss over say, ideally the lifetime of the agent. Okay. Usually then you talk about rewards, so the agent gets rewarded, and the goal is to maximize reward. And if you put everything together, um, so there is this picture here now, you have an agent interacting with an environment, the agent takes actions, receives observations, and some rewards can be scarce, so only at the end of the game you win or lose or something, okay? And then you use the Solomonov distribution, put in the planning aspect, what you get is this equation here. Okay, and this one is the Diana Jones equation, which solves all problems. <laughs> okay, so if you could implement this one here, um, you would have solved the AI problem. You would have a super intelligent agent. Okay, why? So if you know, if you're taking an AI course, you know that if you play games, I mean zero sum games like chess, you do the minimax search up to the end of the game. That's the optimal strategy. Okay. So the real world is more complicated, it's, but it's sometimes also nice, it's not necessarily adversarial. So if you have a distribution, what you do is instead of a minimax, you do an expectimax, okay? You try to maximize, the environment is just stochastic. Okay, so this is this expectimax here, it's not drawn as a tree, but you maximize over your actions, that is the current time k, and um, that um, is, say, assume that the agent dies you know, at, at age M, yeah? and you maximize and you have a horizon up to the death of the agent, and this sums here um, corresponds to the expectation part, then um, what do you want to maximize? You want to maximize the reward sum over the lifetime of the agent, and now you have to take the expectation with respect to a distribution, and I told you to take the Solomon of distribution M of X, which I have written down here in explicit form. So what it does here, and now it connects again to what I've talked before, so you take all worlds Q, so environment or world is described by a program Q, which are still consistent with what I know, okay? What does it mean? So if Q is a, a correct, a potentially correct model of my world, at least if I have a certain action sequence, it would, should reproduce the observation reward sequence I already know, right? If it doesn't, there's something wrong with my model. So I only took those which are consistent with what I know, and then I weigh them with two to the minus the length of the description. I could choose here from a goal of complexity, it doesn't make any difference, okay? So I take a weighted average over all possible worlds which are still consistent with my data, and that gives me my belief distribution, okay? And then I do the planning over that, okay? And, well, it's probably hard to absorb in half an hour, but I mean, if you stay at it long enough and you know the background theory, sequential decision theory, and Solomonov's universal theory of induction, they're both optimal in their own domain, right? Solomonov for prediction, not knowing anything, sequential decision theory for making decisions, knowing exactly the model, and you put them together, so it's reasonable that this is the optimal decision maker in arbitrary, unknown worlds. And if you think about this sentence, this sounds like a super intelligent system, right? Okay. Okay, um, we still have the problem, you know that it's in computer. Okay. And so computer scientists often don't like that. I mean, so it's the job of the computer scientist to come up with, you know, uh, an algorithm which really runs, yeah? But this is really special to the field of computer science. In all other fields, this is secondary. So in physics, I mean, you try to come up with theories which are correct, and then it's a nuisance to sort of approximate and implement them, but it's never a guiding principle, okay? Super string theory is way too hard to compute, so we, we throw it away, right? You know, quantum chromodynamics, all these theories. And only, also in other fields, you know? You have all kinds of complex biological models, which, you develop in order to be faithful or sufficiently faithful, and then you have a big computational problem. And so this is the separation here. So now we have a mathematical theory what in principle we should do. It's sort of a gold standard for general intelligent systems. We can study that theoretically for, for many, many years. 
studied that for five years, not doing more or less anything else. But at some point you think, okay, maybe you know, it would be great if you can actually do something with it in practice too. So you want to approximate that. So I will not bore you with any theorems, um, but um, show you some approximations. Okay. Yeah, I will do that now. And well, some problems are hard. I mean, some problems, I mean, you heard about NP-comp problems, um, but this is even harder, so it's incomputable, the problem, okay? Um, it's actually, I mean, if you know the arithmetic hierarchy, it's luckily not two out there, so I think it's in delta two, so you know, sigma two, pi two, so it, it is sort of limit computable, so you can write an algorithm which, if you let it run sufficiently long, then it produces the right action, but you don't know how long you should run the algorithm. That's the problem, okay? And, and even if you knew it, you know, it would be completely infeasible. So, I mean, and P is small, right? You know, P space is small. Okay. Um, so, we need to approximate that. And there are various ways to approximate that. There are some nice universal tricks like universal search. Um, uh, just as a side remark, for instance, could it be that somebody proves P is equal NP, but that's a non-constructive proof and they still don't have the polynomial algorithm? No, that can't be the case because there is an algorithm which is for all inversion problems where you can verify the solution quickly, um, like the NP. Um, um, this is the fastest algorithm, so if there exists a polynomial time algorithm for NP could be problems, we already have it. Okay, that's called Levin search. So I have an algorithm, and if somebody proves that p is equal np, well, it, it, I mean, if p is equal np, then it runs in polynomial time. So if somebody proves it, then I know this will run in polynomial time. Okay. Um, so these ideas also sound quite abstract, but recently, sort of, they have been even implemented, and you can do something with it. And I mean, there's still, you know, large multiplicative constants and so on. Okay. And with the learning, I mean, this agent I designed is, is a sort of reinforcement learning agent because you have rewards, and there's, of course, you know, down-to-earth research also in reinforcement learning. And there's a nice book by Sabin Barto, and there are lots of ideas um, in there. Um, the the Kolmogorov complexity part. So what what you do there is you you try to find the shortest description of your data, and that's exactly what a self-extracting archive does. Was it a self-extracting archive? It is something, if you run it, it reproduces your original data, right? So you could use that as an upper bound to Kolmogorov complexity. And um, with improving compressor technology, right, these upper bounds get better and better, and I could just sort of exploit that. And, well, for the expected max tree, for instance, there are Monte Carlo algorithms rather than doing the expectation exactly. You could sample, for instance. Um, and there are all kinds of tricks in optimization. Pascal talked about that. So um, we have to pull you know, a lot of tricks together to make that um, computationally feasible. Okay. And so here are some results. So what we did is was the expected max is via Monte Carlo sampling. We used some modern tricks from Computer Go, um, and for the Solomonov distribution, we just we actually used some standard compressors um, which compress files, and uh, applied to some toy problems here. So I mean, you know, the standard grid world problems in AI and the cheese maze and so on, and some, some bigger problems like tic-tac-toe, uh, very trivial form of poker, coon poker, and, and, and up to Pac-Man. So what you have here is it's the experience cycle, so 100 to 1 million. That is the normalized reward, so one is optimal play. And you see that for all these environments, apart from the Pac-Man, um, the system learns to play optimally. Okay. So that may not look very impressive. I mean, these are all small games, but the impressive point is that it's a single agent, just using standard compressors, Monte Carlo search. There is no knowledge about the specific game, not even the rules of the game. And this single agent is able to learn perfect tic-tac-toe, learn able to play, you know, um, cool poker, learn to play somewhat Pac-Man, and so on. Okay? And that's what general AI is about. You want a single system which is able to do or at least learn a wide variety of tasks. Okay? Um, there is another approach which I actually will skip over. 
which is a little bit more practical and was inspired by that. Um, I can skip over that because the experimental results are at the moment just comparable. So catching up, but it's not really better at the moment. Okay. So. Here um, you have the theory of universal AI with the IXI model. Um, here you have the underlying theories which are necessary um, for defining the theory, information theory, learning, planning, and complexity theory are all um, the, the, the important um, building blocks of this theory. And then there are various approximations, and you use in your search algorithm, optimization algorithms, and so on um, to do something practical with it. Okay. I have not talked about the interface, right? I mean, so if you have robotics, you have a vision system and actuators and so on. In theory, you don't have to do anything. You just take the raw camera image and the raw um, the actuator signals and interface it to IXI, and, and IXI will deal with everything. In practice, what you have to do is you need some computer vision pre-processing to make sort of these input-output streams small and reduce it to reasonable size. And then only the core sort of is the universal part. It's also similar to how our brain works, right? I mean, we have some special algorithms, algorithms for vision and for hearing, and then we have a general core in our brain. Okay. Um, so let me come to the discussion section now. Um, so I've started with an informal definition of intelligence, and if you compare this informal definition to the formal, this one-line equation, you can see that it nicely captures this informal definition. But then, if you look up, what is usually regarded as um, correlated with intelligence, so we have reasoning, creativity, association, generalization, pattern recognition, problem solving, memorization, planning, achieving goals, learning, and so on, right? And then you look at this simple equation or the simple definition and ask yourself, well, I mean, wait, I mean, it is very important to have a system which reasons, right? So where is this reasoning going on? Yeah? And what you can show in parts actually by rigorous proofs and formalizing the things, in part sort of by intuitively analyzing these equations, is that um, all these aspects are emergent properties. Okay? So for instance, where's the reasoning going on? Okay, the planning part, planning is reasoning, that's a certain kind of reasoning. The more important part is probably the um, the learning about the environment. So how does the system learn and reason about it? Well, it tries to compress the environment. And I mean, if you have, I mean, if you're a scientist and you have data and you try to analyze it, you have to reason a lot in order to see the structure. And that's all going on implicitly in Kolmogorov complexity. Okay, it's all hidden there, but it's all going on there. When you try to build a practical compressor, you need to understand the data, right? The, and I mean, if you take, take natural language and you just take, say, um, the, the, the syntactical structure, then you can compress that well. But if you take semantics into account, uh, you can compress even better. Okay. So, yeah, where's the creativity in the system, for instance? Yeah. Well, I don't have a very high opinion about creativity. I mean, I think creativity is just randomly combining um, facts and ideas you already had in the past, and then filtering and selecting, and then occasionally something great comes out. Okay? And I mean, this is what the system also does. Um, where's the problem solving? Well, I mean, if the goal is to play chess well, and you reward it for playing chess well, right? Yeah. Then it first it will learn the rules of the game. Then it will learn to what, what winning means and so on. And then it, it learns how to play well. So it learns to solve the problem of playing chess. Yeah. So the problem solving um, is a special aspect of reward maximization. Memorization is trivial because I mean the whole history is stored. Yeah. Sometimes you hear, well, we cannot store the whole history, but if you make some um, back on the envelope calculation, um, that is already now not really a problem. Okay? And the human brain actually stores quite a lot, often not accessible. But. Okay, um, and well, there are some other aspects of the human mind. So maybe consciousness, self-awareness, sentience, emotions, and so on. So um, where are they? Okay. Um, I don't know, but the point is, if these qualia are relevant for rational decision making, then there should be emergent traits of this theory too. Since I have not formalized them, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's already great to have a mathematical definition of general intelligence, but I don't have a mathematical definition of consciousness or self-awareness and so on. So my claim is that we don't need it, but I mean, that's claim. Okay. 
because I mean, if they are relevant for rational decision making, then they will be emergent. Okay. Okay. Let's see what this system would do in a real world. So you can ask now all kinds of nice questions or philosophical questions or um, societal questions which are interesting. And rather than speculating and arguing with words, you can now write down theorems and proofs, which I think is more interesting and more convincing. So for instance, you can ask, will I take drugs? Okay. I mean, some humans take drugs, most not. Yeah. You can ask, will a super intelligent take drugs? So, okay, what does it mean? Okay, drugs make us happy, so happiness is sort of reward. So, will Ixe, if it's embodied, try to hijack its reward system and give it always sort of reward one, right? So that's the analog. Yeah. And you can formalize that. And um, well, if it's virtual, sort of you can rent it. But if it's embodied. Um, it's not really settled, so there's a mathematical theorem which says, yes, it will do that, but um, that makes certain assumptions which may not be plausible. Mm. And then even if the system hijacks as a reward, it still has to protect the state. It doesn't want to be switched off or crashed by an asteroid, right? So it still is motivated yeah, to protect itself and from all kinds of disasters, and that needs quite some intelligent actions. Yeah. So the, the matter is not settled, but the point is that you can um, mathematically analyze these questions. Um, so for another fun question is, will it commit suicide? Uh, well, if you raise IC2 um, um, that it will go to hell, then probably not. But if you raise it that it believes it goes to heaven, then possibly yes, right? Yeah. I mean, the Christians have this safety clause, right? If you commit suicide, then you go to hell, and not to heaven if you were otherwise nice, so um, we could build that in too. And will it self-improve? Yes, of course, you know, uh, because self-improvement helps to achieve more rewards. Okay. And you know, there are all kinds of questions you can now ask, and some of them have been answered. And um, who has heard about the technological singularity? Mm, who has not heard about it? Okay, half, half. So that is the scenario. If you have a technology to build general purpose AI, um, which is on the human level, then they build, or maybe as epsilon beyond that, then they will build even smarter systems and faster computers. So at the moment, the, um, the technological cycle is two years, every two, or 1.5 years, let's say two years, the um, computing speed and memory doubles, right? And that was the case for 50 years, and it could continue for quite a while if you look at physics, so there, the limitations are you know, far away. And now computers take over, um, and they do the technology. Well, they also need two years, right? It, it doubles. But now the, the AI systems run on hardware with twice the speed. I mean, why is it two years? It's not, you know, if, if you just do nothing, it's not two years. It's because it, it takes two years for us sort of to to improve the technology and so on. But they run on twice as fast hardware, so it takes them only one year, right? To double their capacity. And then they run on twice as fast hardware, so it takes only half a year to double. And then one quarter of a year and so on. So and if you add that up, you know, if you remember, two plus one half, plus one plus one half, plus one quarter and so on, and up to a finite number four. Yeah? So that means once we reach AGI, it needs another four years, and then we have infinitely many, uh, infinitely smart, intelligent agents. I mean, of course, nobody knows whether it will happen, and of course, there are physical limitations and so on. And um, but it's a scenario which you shouldn't rule out lightheartedly as um, as ridiculous. Okay. So, and that's called the technological singularity. And um, so, and then people think about, I mean, how will that look like? What will happen there? And well, it's a very hard to analyze. I mean, it's like an ant trying to understand sort of human society. Um, so if we try to understand the super intelligences, and most people believe you can't do anything, um, I'm sympathetic to that, but maybe they can do. I mean, we have this IC system here, right, which is, at least if you believe the assumptions, is the smartest agent possible. I mean, they cannot implement that. You can only get closer and closer, but we have mathematical tools to analyze that. And I have you know, presented you some questions, and some of them can be answered. So maybe we can even sort of speculate in a somewhat principled way about what happens beyond um, or at the singularity. Okay. Um, so, well, here's some final questions, but maybe I just 
leave that here and you can ask some questions. Okay. If you don't know questions, you can read them and then answer them. Okay, questions? Comments? Yep. Yes. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, to be honest, it would be half of the equation. So, if you look at um, this theory here. So it consists of, so maybe I should say intelligence is data compression plus planning, okay? So um, you have here, so that is the compression part. I mean, here is a Bayesian mixture, but I mean, this sum is dominated by the shortest program Q, which is consistent with the data. So you try to compress your data, which then, in a self-extracting archive, um, which then describes your data, and this is your model of the world, and then you do the planning based on this. And the planning part is rather straightforward, well known how to do that. The, this view of describing the world as the shortest program which is consistent with what you know, that is the thing which is sort of not so um, <coughs> widespread. And so this is the compression part. The better, and I mean, if you, if you take the ultimate compression, you get, you know, a perfect approximation essentially. Um, but um, if you have practical compressors, the better the compressors, the more dominant is this term and, and more, the more structure you capture, okay? And if you believe that this is the most intelligent agent, right, yeah, then you must believe that planning plus compression captures this. Yep? Uh, how can the singularity emerge if AI can't, like, the allocators are removable? Ah, yeah, yeah. So it's a good question. Where do the rewards come from? Okay. Um, so if we want to build systems, you know, at least I mean the, the main motivation for most of us is nowadays to build systems which are somewhat you know friendly to humans, useful to humans, and so on. And if we want to build such systems, it's important that we give the rewards, right? Okay. Um, but so if you, you know, if you if you talk about the singularity and don't care about that, and we ask, so these agents sort of are on Alpha Centauri, are completely autonomous, you know, where do the rewards come from? And that is a big question. Um, what values do we instill in these agents? I mean, some part of the reward should come from maintaining itself, so the battery level and the function of all, all systems and so on. And then the rest of the reward, well, you could choose, you know, be benign to humans, but I mean, this is very hard to formalize. What, I mean, what does benign to humans mean? I mean, you know, Asimov's law of robotics, all kinds of things can go wrong. Or you can say um, it is to, say, explore the universe. And this is actually what we have formalized. So, um, okay, the problem is, um, different people have different goals, and um, it is not clear that this goal is better than this goal, right? Um, but then you can think of, you know, maybe some goals are more universal, more general, or more um, more preferable. And while at least as a scientist, one goal is to explore the world and try to understand it. Okay. So if you reward the system for understanding the world. And you can formalize that as sort of the kalbeck leibler divergence between the two distribution and sort of the base mixture distribution. So you can formalize that. Um, then the goal of this agent will to understand. Oops, okay, my time is out, I think. Um, a singularity appeared. <laughs> so, um, and you can show if you revert the system in this way, then it tries to learn as fast as possible um, how the universe works. And in order to do that, it needs to, of course, explore the world and beyond the world. And you could use this. I mean, but you could think about other goals, but that's the only intrinsic goal at the moment we have formalized. 
So yeah. the practical and more no. useful thing is we give the reward. If you want an autonomous agent towards the singularity, then I think this is possibly an interesting choice. Yeah? Um, you don't want to probably reward it for making paper clips. So I mean, if you know LDC Bukowski, I mean, look at paper clip producing agents. You know, if this is the goal to convert the whole universe into paper clips, you know, uh, I'm personally not too much interested in that. Okay, but maybe others are. Um, yeah. So going along with the idea of getting the AI to kind of understand the world, I guess it's going towards a philosophical question of whether it will start asking questions. Yeah. And again, with the, the other question you had, whether it can learn whether it wants to suicide or not. Yeah. Does that mean that conceivably you can get an AI to start wondering whether religion is something you must believe in. Sure, yeah, I, I, I'm convinced about that. I, I mean, you, your religion plays a role, you know, um, it, it, it binds societies and so on. I mean, it has positive and negative roles. And, you know, maybe some aspects like morality and ethics or so um, is picked up and, you know, hopefully and likely without all the, the remaining fluff, right, because that is rationally not important. Okay. More comments? Yeah? It, I've been thinking about this, and it seems like the, the, the ACD will never be uncertain about what it should do. It might be uncertain about the world, yeah. uncertain about um, certain aspects of the world, but it will never be unsure about what it should do. Yes. Um, that's a, yes, that's a very good question. Um, so um, let me take a step back. It is very interesting that zero-sum games like chess and so on sit usually in computer science, but the more general notion of games um, where you use so non-zero-sum games like a prisoner's dilemma sit in economics. I was always wondering why is this the case, but maybe the reason is the following. Zero-sum games, we know in principle how to play. It's just a computational problem, so give it to the computer scientists. While general-sum games, we don't even know what is the right notion of optimality, so it's a conceptual problem. So give it to somebody else. And once they have solved the conceptual problem, then we come into, I mean, it's not that well separated, but I mean, it, it's interesting. OK. So, and so if you go to these more general games, and the simplest one is the matching pennies. So if you, you throw through coin, uh, two coins, two agents, and if they come up with the same side, one agent gets a reward and the other not. And if they come up with a different side, the other gets a, or they don't throw, they choose the coins, OK? So one tries to match the coin and the other one tries to dismatch. And the optimal, so the Nash equilibrium is then um, a uniform random choice, because any other choice can be exploited. So we see that in these kinds of scenarios, and then they are prototypically for real world, for some real world scenarios, the agent has to randomize. But IXC doesn't randomize, OK? so. What happens if he plays matching pennies? OK, I believe, but we haven't proven that. So if you want a project, right, <laughs> and you like mathematics, yeah, so come to me, that if you interface two of axes, let it play matching pennies, what will happen is that these action sequence will be a so-called Martin Löw random sequence. That is a sequence which is not computable, but it's also not random in the classical sense, but has all the randomness properties you usually test. Okay? Uh, I'll leave it like that. So there is a way, because IXC goes beyond the computability to produce sequences which are deterministic but not computable, and they can have all the randomness properties. Okay? I'm not sure, I mean, sort of, it's a nice way out, so it shows you that I need to go beyond that. But maybe I should, right? But that's, it seems it's safe, uh, but yeah, who knows? Another last maybe question, comment? Otherwise, I think I could end in time even. Okay, thanks.